Shalom, Israel, Brother Reggie Jr. here. So today I'm going to be talking about the tree of life. As promised, I told you guys that I would be uh, breaking down some parts of uh, Genesis chapter 3 as well as Genesis chapter 2. But I'm not going to be breaking these things down in really in any particular order. I'm just going to pretty much go as I'm led. But today I'm going to be dealing with the uh the tree of life and i know some of you guys got some questions about the tree of life was it real you know a lot of people want to know was the tree of life actually real um or was it metaphorical or was it merely uh symbolic was it symbology and i'm here to tell you guys today that it's all three yes the tree of life was real yes the tree of life was metaphorical yes the tree of life was symbolic. It was all three of those things. And one thing that I've began to understand about the Lord, and the Lord is an absolute genius. He loves to use the physical to teach you about the uh, spiritual. And what we have to understand too in this Bible, and you guys are going to really see this when I do the lesson about the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, that whole dynamic. But what you guys are going to start to understand is that everything in this Bible is a parable. Now, of course, these are uh, real events, tangible events. But nevertheless, these things are parables. And if you're carnal, you're not going to really understand what you're looking at. Kind of like Joseph. We just look at the story of Joseph and we're like, oh man, that's, that's amazing. But nobody can really see that Joseph was a type of Christ. See, it's stuff like that. And once you get some understanding, you, you begin to realize that the Lord loves to do that. He loves to use, like for instance, when it says the end of the law is Christ, right? That law was teaching us about Christ. And, and that's what I think. That's why I think the Lord is a genius because he understands the carnality of Israel. And that's why he said that he would speak to us in parables, because if we really want to get the understanding in which we seek, we must search out these scriptures and we must pray to the almighty God for the understanding, but everybody else, all these other Israelites who are carnal, you're not going to be able to understand these things. These things are going to be hidden from your eyes. So today I'm about to do this lesson on the tree of life. And some of you guys, you're not going to be able to understand it because you're too carnal. You haven't gotten to the, the point where you understand the spiritual. Before you can understand spiritual things, you got to understand uh, you have to understand the mysteries of carnality, but some of you guys can't even get that far. So it is what it is, guys, but I'm going to go ahead and go ahead and get into this lesson. So let's go ahead and uh, go to Genesis chapter two, because we're going to read where the the tree of life was first mentioned. All right. So Genesis chapter two, and I'm going to read verse eight and nine, and it says, and the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. So he planted a garden inside of Eden in the east. And it says, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And this man was Adam. All right. Verse nine. This is what we came from, what we came for. It says, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, later on uh, in this lesson, you guys are going to see that the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil, they're fruit trees, but they're special. They're, they're a special kind of fruit tree. But I'm going to show you guys that later. But as we can see, the tree of life was mentioned here. But before I get into the the tree of life and how it it in fact is a real tree i want to show you guys that the tree of life is metaphorical and is symbolic in the fact that it really does uh represent certain things and let's see what those certain things are let's go ahead and go to uh 
Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12. And it says, hope deferred maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is a tree of life. So we see here that hope and not only hope, but hope fulfilled. Hope itself is considered a tree of life or the tree of life. Okay, and now let's go to another place. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse four. And it says, a wholesome tongue or a moral tongue or a healing tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness therein is a breach in the spirit. So healing words or moral words that is considered, as we just read, as a tree of life. OK, so we're seeing all of these different attributes being the tree of life. OK, let's go ahead real quick and go to uh, Proverbs chapter three and verse 18. And it says. Well, let me read up to 17. It says her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace, peace. Verse 18 is what we came for. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her. And happy is everyone that retaineth her. So we see here that wisdom is a tree of life. Why? Because with wisdom, you have great wisdom brings life and wisdom will bring you great success throughout the life that you live. But as we can see, wisdom is even considered to be a tree of life. So the tree of life isn't just really uh, one thing in a certain sense. The tree of life is often symbolically used. OK, but let's go to another place, guys. Proverbs chapter 11, and I'm going to read verse 30, Proverbs 11 and 30, and it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that went of souls is wise. So we see here that the Lord is saying that the works of the righteous is a tree of life. And we know it's a tree of life. Why? Because it's those righteous works. It's those works that are, is going to get you life. That's why the Lord said it. And so as we can see, guys, we just looked at many uh, examples of how the tree of life, this tree that was in the garden was metaphorically used and symbolically used as, you know, it was symbolically and metaphorically used as good works or like uh, good deeds in a sense. I don't know if I said that right. It's kind of hard to say, say it how I want to say it, but. Guys, just because the tree of life was used in a symbolic, in a metaphorical way, it doesn't mean that the tree itself was not real. That That's not what that's saying at all, because throughout the whole Bible, the, the Lord loves to use um, a real the real deal. Like he loves to use the, the natural to talk about the spiritual. And it's no different here with the tree of life. All right. But now, guys, what I want to get into is how the tree of life, the actual tree that was in the garden. OK, this fruit tree, the tree of life. It is eating of the tree of life is directly connected to the obedience is directly connected to obedience to God and dwelling in God's presence. Again, it's directly connected to obedience to God as well as dwelling in the presence of God. All right. So let's go real quick because I want to, um, I want to establish something before we really get knuckle deep into the tree of life. So let's go ahead and go to Exodus chapter 34. And I'm going to read verses 27 through 30. And it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write thou these words, 
For after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. 28. And he was there with the Lord, to mock Moses, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. And he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant and Ten Commandments. And guys, we know that physically not eating water and, and not uh, eating bread for 40 days and 40 nights, we know that this is impossible because man needs that to live. So we see here that something else was keeping Moses alive. And what was that? Dwelling in the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, there is no death. Death doesn't exist in the presence of God. All right. But let me uh, finish this up. Verse 29, it says, and it came to pass. All right. This is when Moses um, leaves the presence of God. It says, and it came to pass when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand, it says, when he came down from the mouth, that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with them. While he talked with him. And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone. Okay. And they were afraid to come nigh him. All right, now let's skip down to verse 33. And it says, until Moses had done speaking with him, he put on, he put a veil on his face. So what we begin to see is number one, Moses didn't eat 40 days and 40 nights. And we know physically that is impossible. A normal person would have died. But we see with the Lord being in the presence of God, death was not a factor to Moses at all. Death was not even in the in the picture. And on top of that, we've seen that physically uh, Moses had begun to change. And Moses himself didn't even realize because it said that in verse 29 towards the end, it says Moses was not that his the, that the skin of his face, that dark black skin. He didn't realize that it shone while he talked with him, while he was talking to God. So Moses, we begin to see that he was, in a sense, his, his physiology changed, in a sense, because he was in the presence of God. And make no mistake, brothers and sisters, let's just say Moses decided to stay there. Now, no man ain't gonna live a day, but let's just say Moses was in God's presence for 2,000 years, Moses would have been right there for 2,000 years, not eating or drinking. Because when you're in the presence of God, you don't die. That's just the way it is. Now, that's different. Now, hold on now. That's different from getting a change of body. So let's not mix that up. Mortality and immortality. Let's not mix that up. I'm just trying to make a point here. All right. And I'm going somewhere at this. And where I'm going with this, guys, is that God is the source of life. Make no mistake. The tree of life, all of that stuff, make no mistake. That is not what gives you life. What gives you life is you being in the presence of God. Okay? That's what gives you life. You guys remember that when uh, Christ came on the scene in his first advent, he was healing the sick. He was raising the dead. Why? Because in his presence, those things cannot be. God is an eternal God. And so those things that surround him and abide by him, those things must be alive. They must have life. So what we're, what I'm saying here is God is the source of life, not some tree not some river, not some garden. Those things can only be enjoyed by having life, by having life in the presence of God. But let's go ahead and, and look at um, how God is the prescriber of life and not some tree. God is the source of life. 
and we must never forget that. So let's go ahead real quick, guys, and let's go to John chapter 14. John chapter 14, I'm going to read verse 6, okay? And this is Jesus talking, who is God in the flesh at this time. And it says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and he's what? The life. No man cometh unto the Father, but by me. So right there, the Lord says that he is the life. Okay. In other words, Christ, he is the giver of life. Not some, did it say the tree of life was the giver of life? No, no, God, Jesus, the Christ, he's the giver of life. He gives life. He decides who's going to get life and he decides who's going to get death. Okay. Now let's go real quick, guys, to uh, Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8, and I'm going to read verse 34 and 35, and it says, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post of my doors. For whoso findeth me, findeth what? Life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. So this God here, and we know that this is Christ, Old Testament, New Testament, you are only dealing with Jesus. That's what people need to understand. But he says, whoso findeth me, find of life. Why? Because this God and the Father too, they are the source of life. So we look at the natural, and we, oh yeah, see, it's this, this stuff it's it's this physical stuff that um is giving us life like the tree of life that was physical that was real but it was not the source of life there's a difference okay but we can clearly see that god he is the source of life so let's go to uh first john chapter 2 and i always have trouble finding first john Every single time, I always have a problem finding 1 John. But yeah, guys, 1 John chapter 2, and I'm going to read verse 17, and it says, well, let me read verse 16. It says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but it's of the world. Because if you're of the father, you don't worry about these earthly things. Why? Because verse 17, and the world passed the way and the lust thereof. Because the Lord is going to do away with these things that we deal with in this world now and he's going to do away with evil people, okay? But this is the part I came for and this is the second half of verse 17 and it says, but he that doeth the will of God and what is the will of God? That you keep his commandments and that you believe on Jesus. It says, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Meaning he's going to have that person who does those things is going to have eternal life. They're going to have life everlasting. They're going to be granted the gift, the reward of life. Okay. So we can see there that God, he is the only one that can give life. And he's the only one that can decide to give you death as well. So let's go ahead real quick, guys. And let's go back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 36. And it says, He that believeth on the Son, whoever believeth in Jesus, it says, hath the everlasting life. And he that believeth not on the Son, okay, that go for you non-Messianics, shall not see life, but the wrath of God, okay, death abideth on him. So as we see, Christ is the one that gives life. He's going to be the one that decides that you get, give life, you get life, and getting life is by dwelling in his presence. 
But if not, you're going to get death. And that's to be that's to be out of the presence of God and to be casted into outer darkness, being given to the flame of the lake of fire. So make no mistake, guys, life is to dwell in the presence of God. So now let's go ahead real quick, guys, and go to Genesis chapter three, because what I'm about to show you guys is how. See, to eat of the tree of life, see that eating of the tree of life, that is directly connected to being in the presence of God. In order to eat from this tree, you must dwell in the presence of God. Like there is no separating the two. They're both inner, they're they're both intertwined, they're both connected. So if you want to eat of the tree of life, and you're going to see what the tree of life is, it's very simple. And it's not hard at all. And nothing to get weirded out over or spooky. That's these nations we are among. They made it into something mythological, something mysterious and creepy. But it's not, guys. It's real simple. God is a simple God. But, but if you want the right to eat from the tree of life, that comes with the reward of being of being given life and the reward of being able to dwell in the presence of God forever. Because if you're not in the presence of God, you're not going to eat of the tree of life. Don't even, don't even worry about the tree of life. If you're not in the presence of God, forget it. Don't even, don't even think about it. You must dwell. That's why you must get life. That's why you must make it into the kingdom, both millennial and into the father's kingdom. Because to make it in that is to eat of this tree of life, this physical tree, okay? But let me uh, stop doing so much talking, guys. Let me uh, read some more scripture. So let's read real quick Genesis chapter three. And let's read uh, verse 22. And it says, and the Lord God said, behold, the man to my Adam is become one of us to know good and evil. Now, let's see. I want you to uh, you guys to look at this now, how the tree of life and how dwelling in the presence of God goes hand in hand. It says, and now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Okay. And then 30, 23, I forgot to include this, but it says, therefore, the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. Verse 24. And it says, so he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and uh, well, let me just keep reading. And a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So the correlation here is that yes, the tree of life indeed. Now I won't get into the physical aspects of the tree until just a little bit later, but I'm just right now trying to get you guys to see that eating of the tree of life, and I have to keep repeating it because I got to get it through your head. To eat of the tree of life is a direct result of dwelling in the presence of God. Because when you're kicked out of the presence of God, forget the tree. To be kicked out, to be separated from God, that is death. And notice, once Adam and his wife, once they were kicked out of the garden, notice they started dying. Now, because they were fresh out, notice how they still lived a very long, well, I didn't say anything for Eve, but I'm sure she lived long. But you notice Adam lived a very long time. He didn't get to see a full day. Remember, a thousand years with man is as a day to the Lord. But Adam didn't live a day with God. He only, he didn't quite reach them a thousand years, which is a millennial reign with Christ. He didn't reach that, but he lived a long time. But notice as, Adam began to have children, okay? The more separated man became from God, the more man started dying. And all the way down to 2021, you notice that 
people are dying at 15, 10, people not even making it to their 20s, uh, babies dying in the womb. And because the more you're separated from the presence of God, the more death is prevalent. And so it's not so much that the tree of life gave Adam life. It's not that it granted him life. Now, the tree does have healing properties and stuff. And I'm going to go to that a little bit later. But the point is, is to enjoy of this tree, you must be in the presence of God. Life, that's what that's OK. Let me see if I can say it right before I move on. Life is only possible in the presence of God. OK, and when I say life, I mean life everlasting because. Adam and Eve, once you understand the presence of um, the plan of God, you begin to understand that God never uh, and created Adam and Eve to die. They were going to live them a thousand years, just like we're going to have to do all over again when Christ comes back. They were going to live for those thousand years. And once them thousand years were up, I believe the Lord was going to change them. He was going to give them their immortal bodies, but Adam, he fell before he could get to that point. All right. But make no mistake, life and dwelling in the presence of God, they go hand in hand. And to eat of this tree means you have to be in the presence of God. All right. But let me just move on, guys. I don't want to keep uh, beating the dead horse. So I believe I read. Yeah, Genesis 3, 22 and stuff. So now, guys, let's go ahead and uh, read Revelation 2 and 7 because the Lord says something uh, fairly interesting here. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. So this is what the Lord says. This is Jesus speaking now to God that's going to give us life. He says this to us, the saints. He that hath an ear. Let him hear what the spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst or the middle of the paradise of God. And what is that paradise? That paradise is Eden. It's the garden. And guess what, brothers and sisters? We're going back. When Christ returns, we're going back to Eden. Okay, but right now we got to, you know, of course, live out this uh, this horrible captivity. But as you can see, he says, if you overcome, he said he's going to give you to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. But how do you get into the paradise to even eat of this physical tree? You must be given the reward of life. You must what? You must overcome you must be able to dwell in the presence of God. And God only wants the righteous. Okay. He only wants his righteous seed in his presence. The wicked, they are not going to eat of this tree of life. You know where they're going to be? They're going to be, they're going to be given the death sentence. They're going to be plunged into death. They're going to be out of the presence of God. And they're going to be in outer darkness in the lake of fire, burning forever and forever more. That's never going to end. But as you guys can see, the tree of life is in paradise. And this paradise is what? It's the kingdom, both millennial and the father's kingdom. That is paradise. But in order to dwell there, God is only dealing with the righteous. He's not playing that other stuff, man. So to even eat of this tree, you must, you must have life. You must dwell and to have life is to dwell in the presence of God. Life is dwelling in the presence of God. So eating of that tree is only possible. You can't separate the two. They, they're intertwined. Eating of that tree is to be dwelling in the presence of God. No, you're physically eating from the tree. Don't make no mistakes. I'm just trying to show you the dynamic, how it's inseparable. Okay. Now let's go ahead and go to Revelation 22. Revelation uh, chapter 22 
And I'm going to read verse 13 and 14. It says, this is what Jesus said, right? He says, I am Alpha and Omega. So the Lord right here, he is automatically, he's establishing his supremacy, okay? We, one thing we got to understand, our God, he's a God of supremacy. He's going to let you know off the bat, I'm the most high. I run this thing. I'm the first, I'm the beginning, and I'm the end. That's what he's saying. He says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Guess what, brothers and sisters? You're going to have to deal with Jesus. Ain't no getting around him. You got to deal with him. That's what he telling him. I'm the beginning and I'm the end. I created you and at the end, you're going to have to deal with me. All right. But let's uh, let's keep reading verse 14. That's what I came for. It says, blessed are they that do his commandments. OK, so now we understand that his audience here is the righteous seed. Okay, we understand that these are the saints who is what? Israel. He says that they, okay, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. So he's talking about paradise right here. And remember, the tree is in paradise. But don't even worry about eating from the tree if you ain't even in paradise. Because if you cast it out to outer darkness, you're not going to see this tree and you ain't going to be eating from it. Okay? But it's only going to come to those who do his commandments. Or like it said in uh, Revelation 2 and 7, those who overcome. It's saying the same thing here. It's just it's saying it in a different way. But something should go off in your mind. I know the Lord is a God of parables. He used a lot of metaphorical stuff and symbology stuff. He loved to use the natural. You know, the first thing that should pop in your mind is throughout the Bible. What is the obsession? At, like, ask you seriously, just stop. Just, you know, get some food and just think about it. What is this obsession over a tree? What is this obsession about the tree of life? The Lord always talking about the tree. The Lord always talking about how um, I am the root, but you are the branches when he was to my Israel. OK, and that's where the model of the menorah comes from, because the menorah is basically a tree. You got to ask yourself, what is this obsession with the tree? That brothers and sisters should be your cue to realize Oh, shoot, this tree of life. Yo, this ain't a game like this tree is legit real. This ain't just metaphorical. This ain't just symbology. Yeah, the Lord will use symbolic things. He'll use parables. But for him to be talking about trees or a tree like that, there must really be a tree of life. And when you get some understanding, you realize that there is one and it's right in the middle of the paradise of God. OK. But now we are going to get into the physical description of the tree of life. Now, here we go. Now, let's read Genesis chapter one and verse twenty nine. OK. So that way we can get an understanding of this tree and what it's like. This actual tree. Let's get some physical descriptions of what it's like. So just bear with me, guys. Genesis 1 and 29. And it says, Be And God said, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth. And every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you, it shall be me. OK, so right here and boy, don't that sure sound a lot like Genesis chapter two and uh, verse uh, 15 and 16. It sound awfully familiar, don't it? But let's not go off topic, guys. Let's just uh, keep it going. 
But we see in uh, Genesis 1 and 29, we see that the Lord created vegetation for man to eat. And he also created fruit trees for man to eat. So we're dealing with vegetation, okay? And we're dealing with fruit trees, okay? that That's the only thing at this time that man consumed. Now remember, Adam, as well as his wife Eve, never forget, brothers and sisters, that they were flesh. We cannot forget that. And make no mistake, I do believe that because they were in the presence of God in the garden, I do believe that they were like Moses. Based off of what it, it, it said in um, Exodus 34, I really do believe that they too, their skin shined. I believe all of that, okay? But right now, what we're dealing with, forget the vegetation part, what we're dealing with right here, guys, are actual fruit trees, okay? Keep this in your mind. Now, let's go right next door. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 9. Now, pay very close attention, brothers and sisters. It says, Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight as well as good for food. OK, so right now we are dealing with edible fruit trees. OK, don't don't just have amnesia and forget forget. I just read that we are dealing with fruit trees. Just like I said in Genesis 1 29. Right. You got to keep the thought going. OK. Out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and or as as well as good for food, right? Now look at this, y'all. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden. Yeah, but it say a tree of life. Yeah, but what did it just tell you in Genesis 1 and 29? What did it just tell you in the first half of Genesis 2 and 9? We are dealing with fruit trees, physical fruit trees. Just because an I'm going to make another video, of course, but I'm just trying to deal with this. The tree of life, which is a fruit tree, brothers and sisters, also in the midst or the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Make no mistake, brothers and sisters. That also was a fruit tree. OK. That also was a fruit tree. Now, I'm going to be making another video um, talking about the tree of life as well as the tree of life and good and evil. And I'm going to be showing you guys the parable of that and the, the dynamic of that so you guys can understand what you're looking at. But what the Lord is doing here in verse 9, he's showing you a parable. What he's giving you literally right here is something natural to show you a parable, okay, for future generations. But make no mistake, brothers and sisters, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they are fruit trees. Now, these are special fruit trees, of course, and I'm going to show you. Well, we don't get a description of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but we do get a physical description of the tree of life and what it was like. So now let's go to Revelation chapter uh, 22. It's the... Uh, Last uh, book, last testament in the Bible, okay? Revelation chapter 22 and verse 2. And it says, uh, let me just go ahead and read verse 1. And he shewed me a pure river of water of life. And guys, we're going to talk, I'm going to make another video talking about the river, okay? But we're not... Uh, here to talk about that today, but I just want to let you know I will be making a video about this river and it says clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. Okay, verse 2 in the midst of the street of it, okay, in the midst or in the middle, it says, and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. Now, 
What we can understand from the scriptures is we understand that the tree of life is in the middle of the paradise of God. Right. And we know at this time we're going to be in Jerusalem. So this tree of life is, in fact, going to be in the middle of Jerusalem. But that's besides the point. Let's keep reading because I'm trying to get something else out of this. It says and the midst of the street of it and on either side of the river was there the tree of life. So here go this tree of life now. Now we see that this river is coming from the throne of the father and the throne of the lamb and it's coming and it's watering this, this, this tree of life, okay? And it says, which bear 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation. So now, this tree of life this physical tree is unlike any tree that we have ever seen. And the reason why it says 12 manner of fruits, we have to understand everything is modeled after the 12 tribes of Israel. But this fruit tree is unlike any fruit tree we see today. Like we never seen a tree like this. Go show me if we have a tree like this today. I ain't never seen a tree like this. It says the tree of life, this fruit tree bears 12 manner of manners of fruit. So it's not saying that there's only 12 fruits on the tree. Oh no, make no mistake. This tree of life is probably jai freaking gannic. Okay, make no mistake about that. But it's not saying there's only 12 fruits on the tree. No, it's saying there's 12 manners, meaning it produces 12 types of fruit. Show me a tree today that show me a tree that that produces 12 types of fruit at once show me a tree that bears lemon limes grapes all of that kind of stuff you know what i'm trying to say trees today only bear one kind of fruit it's only one kind of tree you got a lemon tree you got an apple tree banana tree but not a tree that bears every or not every fruit but 12 types of fruit we never seen a tree like that okay never ever seen a tree like that before well that's the physical description that it gives for the tree of life it's a massive tree that has 12 types of fruits on it it doesn't say what type of fruit so don't ask me i don't know what kind of fruit it's only I know what kind of fruit exists in this world today, but I don't know what kind of fruit this is. It doesn't say it doesn't give us a description of it. It just says it 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 uh produces 12 types of fruits. OK, and then it also says something else. OK, it says something about the leaves of this tree. It says the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nation. So. This tree of life, not only does it bear 12 types of fruit, but it also, its leaves are for healing, okay? This, this, these leaves serve as some kind of, it's, it's basically a herb, it serves as medicine, okay? So it's obvious guys that the tree of life this is indeed a special kind of tree, a tree that you can literally eat from and a tree that you can literally get some healing from. But remember, guys, it's, it's, this tree can only be accessed if you are in the presence of God. They're like hand and glove. You can't separate those two things. So you must have life and life is to be dwelling in the presence of God. You must have life to even eat of the tree. So it's not necessarily that the tree itself is giving you some kind of superpower in your human, you're some kind of robot. No, it's not that it's doing that. It's just the fact that you have access to it because you are in the presence of God, if that makes sense. But guys, that is it for this lesson. I tried to do my best to, um, you know, explain that it's a little bit difficult. It's my first time teaching it. I tried to teach it the best I could, at least this time around. Hopefully in the future, I can get around to uh, teaching it some more.
you know, hopefully I get an even better understanding of these things. But I'm actually really, you know, hyped everybody to teach on um, the dynamic between not necessarily the dynamic, but the parable of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because what we looked at in Genesis uh, uh, 2 and 9, I believe, let me make sure I'm quoting it right. And Genesis, yeah, 2 and 9, what we're looking at right there, guys, we're looking at a parable. That is exactly what we're looking at. And in my next video, that is what I'm going to go over, the parable of the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I think you guys are going to get some uh, very good understanding out of that. I just ask you guys to be patient and, uh, you know, just bear with me. It's my first time teaching this stuff. But, uh, you know, we all just learning together, guys. We just opening up the book and we just taking a look at this stuff because when we were in the Christian church and then even when we transitioned to the Sabbath church, you know, the teachers, these pastors and stuff, they don't go over this stuff, man. They skip over it because, you know, what they're afraid. They don't want to be looked at as weird and some kind of conspiracy nutcase. But ain't nothing weird, guys, about you know this word it's these heathen that's infected our mind into turning our own word into some kind of mythological creature monster story myth or something like that or some kind of fable so we kind of mythologize the bible but guys the bible is full of parables and you know the bible is very simple the god loves to use the natural to describe the physical okay and together it's made perfect. Okay? Like faith and circumcision. Okay? Circumcision of the mind and physical circumcision. Stuff like that. Together it's made perfect. Because not only are you doing the natural, you got the physical. I mean, you got the spiritual to go with it. That's what makes it whole. Okay? But I'm just trying to... All I'm doing, guys, is I'm just trying to make a point. That's, that's all I'm trying to do. Is just make a point and I'm just trying to get into these scriptures because there's so many things in here you know that we've never seen but uh, I'm excited like I said to go over you to go over with you guys the dynamic between the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil I'm excited to talk to you guys about you know this river of life I'm excited to talk to you guys about uh, Eden as well as the guard. I'm excited to do these breakdowns because it's not not only are you guys learning, but you have no idea when I teach these lessons, you know, I'm I'm learning myself. It doesn't matter how much I, you know, study the word and stuff like that. It's like I don't really get any understanding or anything like that until I actually teach it. That's when I begin to understand even more things than I did when I was actually just studying it by itself if that makes sense but that's it for this video guys i hope you guys got some understanding and i will see you in the next video shalom